Hello, everyone. My name is Janet Yang, and I'm very pleased to be here today to introduce you to the filmmakers of Finding Yin. We have with us the director, Jenny Shu, as well as two of the producers, Diane Kwan and Brent Huffman. Let's bring them on now. Hi. Hi, Janet. Hi, 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 Hi Janet. Hi, Janet. Hi, everyone. This has been such a, an emotional um, screen for me. And, and it's because I have, I sort of did a little bit of the reverse of what a lot of the Chinese students uh, who come over here have done. I went to live in Beijing after college uh, to work and live there and experience that feeling of wanting to blend in, but realizing that I'm not exactly who, uh, you know, everyone else was and, you know, and already feeling a little bit uh, out of sorts being growing up in an all white neighborhood. Um, but I have met so many, so many Chinese students who come over and I've mentored a lot of particularly young Chinese women and I stay in touch with many of them and I feel like they're part of my family in a way. And I've been so um, interested in the journeys that they take and your film provides a really, really nuanced glimpse into that. The dreams about coming to America, what some of the uh, acclimation problems are, et cetera. So let's start with Jenny. I just want to hear a little bit more about your background because in some ways I believe it mirrors that of you, right? Tell me where you were born and raised and, and what you're studying and what was in your mind when you thought about coming to America. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Shanghai, China and I went to college in Beijing, uh, I went to Peking University and studied journalism there. Um, and I graduated in 2016. And after I graduated from college, I actually went straight to graduate school in the US. Um, I went to study journalism at Northwestern University for my master's degree. So when I was still in China, I always wanted to see a bigger world. And I understand that you know, being a journalist or learning journalism in China there are certain limits. So I just wanted to see um, in America, you know, how people are doing in the journalism industry and the potentially to seek what else I could do for my future. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to study abroad. Um, and in 2016, you know, I came here, um, for me, like all I knew about US uh, was basically, you know, before I came here was basically from books, uh, movies, right? And uh, I just feel like, you know, the feeling being here was really different from what like I thought before I came here. Um, I was very ambitious when I first came here, um, but the reality was um, I was really lonely and homesick. Um, and there were a lot of, you know, language barriers and, uh, you know, cultural differences, even though I thought I was fully prepared uh, before I came here. So that took me a lot, uh, you know, to overcome all the difficulties. Um, and then I graduated in 2017, uh, and I've been working as a documentary filmmaker since then. Um, and right now I'm based in Chicago. Hey, well, you have you've said a lot of different things and I wanna backtrack and, and say, first of all, for those who don't already know, Peking University is the most difficult university to get into in China in an already extremely, extremely challenging uh, environment and the amount of pressure that students have in high school to get into that right university because as it was mostly here but less so now it makes or breaks your life doesn't it if you get into a certain kind of university life can be much smoother and if you don't and so the pressure the pressure to get into that is intense the pressure is pretty great here but the pressure in China is nothing like that. When I was uh, hired by Disney to make a version of High School Musical, the first thing that our Chinese partners said to us is, there's just no way in the world that anybody could relate to Chinese high school students singing and dancing in the hallway. Like that is not the environment that we actually, you know, uh, are, are able to to live in so it is so intense so we, we placed it in the college anyway it's just an example incredibly people have probably seen pictures of these thousands and thousands I mean the whole country kind of comes to a, a grinding halt just to let the students focus solely on their studies and get 
get, you know, and have sort of like days of silence while the students take take their tests. So that already yeah. is a huge achievement on your part, Jenny, and congratulations. Um, you are not only accomplished in that way, but then you chose a really challenging subject matter in journalism because journalism in, in China is operates from very different standards, I believe. And, um, and in China, the word propaganda is not a negative. There is a desire, I think, to create a sense of unity through messaging and through PR. That's what I told um, some friends of mine. I said they shouldn't call this Yunhan, or they should translate Yunhan is not propaganda, but you know, public relations or PR or something that's friendlier because every country experiences it to some degree, but the propaganda sounds, sounds much more harsh. So what was that like to study journalism in China, if you don't mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, so I would say like my motive to be, you know, a journalism student in China was really about, you know, curiosity and I cared about people, uh, you know, in the community and I cared about social issues. And uh, I, I think at the time, you know, I applied to university, I thought about what kind of life I wanted to live, uh, you know, in future. I really wanted to talk to people and experience uh, different lifestyles. And I think that was why I decided to study journalism. I didn't really have a clear vision about, uh, you know, being a journalist in China, to be honest. And I think that was one of the reasons why I, you know, after I graduated, I didn't uh, go straight to be a journalist uh, in China. I decided to come into the US uh, because for me, that's a way to um, get a lot of, I mean, rich experience in a society and really get to know people. Um, that's how I feel. and I totally agree with you know what you said um there are certain limits uh being a journalist in china and even today i just feel um there are like much more pressure uh just doing like regular journalism in china mm. so what did your parents think about all this did they support you coming to the united states or was this a decision that you had to fight them on they they were really supportive uh, and that's why i always said i was i'm, I'm a lucky lucky girl um my parents, they are really supportive of, supportive for my um, decisions. Uh, basically, they trust, they trust my um, judgments, you know, and also mm -hmm. my vision about what I'm gonna do uh, in future. And uh, being a documentary uh, filmmaker, you know, I've never thought about that. And my parents, they never thought about thought about that. And to be honest, uh, in the past few years, when I was working on finding Ying Ying, uh, you know, sometimes there was no progress in terms of, uh, you know, the production and also like fundraising things like that. And uh, I talked to my parents about, you know, what I was doing in the U.S. Um, and uh, at first, I was afraid that they, they, they would, you know, recommend um, that, you know, just going back to China. Um, but to my surprise, they were really supportive, and uh, they just feel. You know, this is uh, this is a project that I wanted to do, and I'm really passionate about it. Uh, and they're they just told me that you know don't worry about uh, you know anything else. Um, you know, if you need anything, just ask us. We we will support you. And uh, we we released a film last year, and it got also got recognition in China. And uh, I mean, just based on my conversation with them, they were really proud of me and really proud of the project uh, I've made. And they are also very supportive for my future career as a documentary filmmaker. Well, that, that you, you are very lucky in that mm -hmm. a lot of people have that respect. And if you don't mind my asking, what kind of work did your parents do? Because sometimes people are in very compromised positions and they have a hard time supporting their children in certain careers. What, what, uh, what, what areas do they work in? Yeah, so my parents, they actually came from rural areas, actually. and. Uh, but they like made money, you know, in like, as I grow up, um, they moved to Shanghai and my mom, she's a housewife. Basically she take care of me. And that's very similar as Ying's mother. She basically take, take care of, um, you know, her children, Ying and the brother. And then my, my father, he worked as a, a businessman. So that somehow could support me like financially. Um, but again, just thinking about studying abroad, being so far away from my own parents, there are still, there are still some you know, uh, sacrifice, especially the 
emotional sacrifice, I would say. Um, my last time, you know, went back to China was in 2018. And I was supposed to visit them like last year. Uh, I just thought, you know, I've finished the film, I'm gonna meet my family. But you know, the pandemic just happened, and I have to change my plan. And I'm hoping to, you know, visit them like this year, but it de still depends on the situation. Um, and I really miss them. Yeah. Yeah. And Jenny has a, a little brother. I, I can't remember how old is he? Seven now? Uh, Sorry. he's nine. Ten. Nine. Yeah. And and Jenny would share with me how often he would say, "When sister, when are you coming home?" If I was well, going to ask whether you were doing like a, a, a only child, but it sounds like you have a younger brother. So at least your parents have that because that's also another heartbreaking thing. There's so many things about Chinese family life that I think would be surprising to the West. I think for many years, I even thought our oh, Chinese families, they, they stay together by hook or by crook, no matter what, no matter what. But what we've seen in recent years is so many Chinese families are split up. Either kids go abroad or parents come here to work and they're sort of shuttling back and forth or and kids are staying behind with their grandparents or there's so many so many surprising and, and really heart-wrenching stories about families who are living apart for the sake of usually economic uh, benefits and whatnot, right? So, and, and now of course with the pandemic and, and with worsening relations between US and China, it creates really a dilemma. I know quite a few people who aren't sure where to go. They, they feel, you know, in the past it was possible to have a kind of foot in both places and now it's increasingly difficult and one must choose. So, okay, so now, you, now you're in the States and, and did you have, a, did you think about going to other countries besides America, like Canada or Australia or Japan or Korea or was it very much the US that you had your sights on? I think pretty much U.S. Uh, because for me, the human connection I've made is also something very important in my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had a lot of friends in China I made in college uh, when I was still a kid. And now I'm in the U.S. It's been four or five years. Uh, and I have, I think, many friends, especially in Chicago. Um, and uh, I have, you know, not only friends in my own life, but also uh, related to my work. Um, I was a diverse voices in documentary uh, program uh, at Cartoon Queen Films. Um, and I have many friends just because of the Cartoon Queen community. And uh, that's also like how I met Diane and many other filmmakers, uh, great filmmakers. And also Brent, uh, I met him when I was in school. So for me, I pretty much, you know, wanted to still continue to uh, create great works um, and based in the US. Well, I, I can certainly see why you want to stay here. Now, I meant that before you came to the U.S., did you consider going to other places? You, Not really. Um, US is, so, and would you say that's really common among Chinese students who want to go abroad is that they have their sights set on the U.S.? There's really no close second. And so that that is really an interesting phenomenon in itself. You know, we have kind of presented ourselves to the world as this is the, the place and, you know, academic freedoms and whatnot. And, Again, that's because it has in the past several years become a very troubled kind of dream because what your documentary shows is that not thing, things don't always go as planned. So you you uh, somehow met the wonderful Diane at Cartemquin, this company which has been such a, an amazing uh, generator of incredible documentary films over so many years. A great admiration, sometimes. Uh, makes me want to move to Chicago because it's an incredible community there and such a caring community and you know tackling subject matters that are not not necessarily easy. I got to know them a little better several years ago when I wanted very much to promote the film Abacus, which I thought was absolutely stunning. And of course I've known about Steve's work over the years. So how did you come together, uh, Diane? How how did you and Jenny meet? Um, well, Jenny, as she mentioned, was at Northwestern, and she was still at Northwestern, and she was actually in Brent's class when she started the Project Bunny Yang, and so she already had started creating a, um, footage for a uh, for her student project, and and then she became a fellow at her Templin, as Jenny mentioned. Um, so Brent already was working with Jenny and um, on the project, and they. As part of a fellow, you can have a work in progress screening. And um, 
so they hosted a screening and they invited me to to go and attend. Jenny and Brent asked me to attend. And for me, I love going to these screenings. That's the same way I met Bing. Bing was also a Diverse Voices fellow and he had a work in progress screening and that's how I met Bing. So to me, it's like this great opportunity to see works of, of new young voices. I just and, want to project for those who don't know, Bing Liu is who you're referring to, right? And, yeah, uh, Bing Liu of Minding the Gap. Movie that and, I think about all the time, which is another extraordinary movie, is Minding the Gap. Yeah, and, so, and Janet, you were so supportive of, of, of Minding the Gap too, so I'll always. I love everything for <laughs> I should be working with you. Anyway, so you saw. Oh, so you I saw went to the work in progress. Was, uh, so yeah. what, what, how far along was it? So the, at that point, it's a student film. So it's about 25 minutes. Danny is not in it. It's, it's, uh, she, she still hadn't gone to China yet. And, but even with what she showed, I could see it was a different way of telling a story about, it's not the true crime story that people would imagine it would be. It really, the, Jenny really wanted to tell the story in a different way. And it, became, it was really obvious even in the short. And um, so, so I, I was so impressed with what I saw, but then I also was so impressed with Jenny. I mean, um, I, I tell people this all the time that when I watched the rough cut of Mind the Gap, as much as I fell in love with Mind the Gap, I really was so impressed with Bing. And I felt the same way with Jenny, you know, just like you, Jen, I think we meet so many young filmmakers and there's so much potential, but sometimes it just, you're, we're just not sure. With Jenny, I, I was sure that she had the vision and the strength and the hard work uh, ethic to make a document, this documentary happen. You, documentaries take so long <laughs> to make and you have to be so strong, um, both both in what you want to accomplish, but also knowing, like Jenny said, there's going to be ups and downs where sometimes we have money and sometimes not. You know, we get a lot of no's and then hopefully we get some yeses. So um, Jenny and Brent, they talked to me a couple months later and asked if I produced with them. Brent was already a producer. So Brent, you might want to talk a little bit about how you came on board with Jenny. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I, I will sing uh, Jenny's praises uh, too. So. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker too, and my work focuses on China. So this was especially interesting to me on many levels. But what kind of work did you do with China? What? What kind of work had you previously done? So I've I've looked at Chinese economic investment in other countries like Afghanistan, and I'm working on one in Pakistan right now. So lots of uh, push into other places in Africa, um, this kind of thing. Um, but I was Jenny's um, professor, like. Uh, like um, we talked about, and I was so impressed. I was so impressed with with Jenny, who you know, this is she's a first time filmmaker. She's brand, you know, brand new to all this, and kind of took on this really ambitious and important project. And I was so impressed with the level of of trust that she was able to kind of gain with the family, and her just real genuine compassion and caring about them. You know, caring about what happened to Ying Ying in, in the early stages. I think we just thought Ying Ying had ran away from home. So we were really, at least I was optimistic that she would be, she would so be found. When, when did you start the process? Shortly after she disappeared? How much time? When things were still unclear? How, how did that all come about? Jenny and Brent, you can both jump in with that. Yeah, I can talk about that. So um, I basically learned about her disappearance maybe like two or three days after she disappeared. Um, and I found out that Ying Ying and I, we went to the same university in China. She was also a PKU, Peking University um, graduate. And uh, I learned about her disappearance through my college alumni group chat on WeChat. Um, and I, at the time, I didn't really think about, you know, making a film, but I was closely following the incidents and I was just spreading the words like any other Chinese students. I post her information on my social media. And I think after, I think that was like a week after her disappearance, her family arrived in the U.S. They went down to Urbana Champagne to search on their own. And that was when I started to think about maybe I should, you know, visit them as well for different reasons. Uh, one was, um, you know, I, I'm a journal, I was a journalism student and I was 
really curious about what happened and what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And the second one was really to see what I could do to help them. Mm -hmm. um, and after I arrived there, I met a volunteer whose name is Shiling Sun. He was a senior student at U of I at that, at that time. Um, and he and I, I mean, we just talk about uh, what we could do, what else we could do, you know, other than visiting the family and uh, delivering food to them. So Shiling, he, he was also interested in like filmmaking. So we just started thinking about maybe we're going to capture what's, what was going on. So mm -hmm. I think that was maybe like two or three weeks after her disappearance mm -hmm. that we started production, even though we didn't really have a clear idea of mm -hmm. what we are going to do with the footage. Right. So Brent, what kind of advice did you give her when she is presumably as she was starting to shoot, she, she approached you for- Well, yeah, I mean, I remember when she was posting about, uh, about the case, I think I wrote you on Facebook saying you should <laughs> you should make a film about this. Um, Ever the true documentarians. What? Well, yeah, right. And I'm very like in the cinema verite mode, so you know I I really wanted Jenny, like like uh, like I said, she did such a great job building trust and uh, uh, you know almost partnering with the family, which is kind of rare in in documentary to be that close. And I really encouraged her, you know, to 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 get close. Um, and a lot of you know a lot of the moments she she got were just these really kind of pure unguarded emotional moments as this as this you know incredible family where you know yinging just meant the world to everybody she knew but you know meant the world to her family you know and and them coming to the U.S. for the first time you know not speaking English um, and in, in some ways I think it was sort of a godsend that Jenny was there to yeah. to help it's them through it comfort as somebody who you know, be a, almost a substitute daughter in a way, just having another presence, I imagine that's hugely comforting to them. Uh, ironically, uh, one of my former interns, I think Diane knows this, is Lana Wong, who's the daughter of the attorney that was eventually hired, right? So she was very much interested in this case. She was telling me about it and what was going on. And, and uh, so there, there's a lot of interconnections Always, and, and I think that's one of the things that I find so touching um, about the Chinese student community. I'm on these WeChat groups with the, the maximum of like 500 people, you know, and I've seen incredible works. Like there was um, a play put on by US, USC and then UCLA Chinese students based on a, on a Chinese director's uh, work and they did it all on their own. I'm just using this as an example, but the worst, but they filled, they filled Royce Hall at UCLA and it was all Chinese students. And I just can think of, it was Meng Jinghui, uh, uh, um, a play by him called Murder in the, well, you know, um, Murder in the Something Garden. And, you know, and I've been involved in, in many situations, I've spoken at, at various universities here in Los Angeles to Chinese student groups. And there's a huge subculture and I, I don't know if people know, and then you probably know the um, group out of USC that started Chihuahua. Is a, it was just a food eating group where a group of Chinese students used to go to sample all the different Chinese restaurants in San Gabriel Valley. And there are so many and they're so authentic and so specific to different regions. So they'd say, this person is actually from Yunnan and is it really good Yunnan food or from Shandong or whatever, right? And that became a huge, um, it's now a, a, a very profitable uh, app, I guess, that you can get. It's not really a huge investment. My point being is that the birth of, you know, we all know that, that if you want to extend that further, the, 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 the founder of Zoom, Eric Yen, is from China. I mean, there's so many ways that Chinese students and past Chinese students have affected our daily lives without people realizing it so much. I mean, forget, you know, about TikTok and so many other apps, you know, invented in China. It's just, it's there, there, it, and yet there's a separation. There's a separation, and it's very sad because somehow there, it, it's difficult. And I've talked to a lot of my Chinese students about that. They tend to want to be with their Chinese friends. They, they tell me that that the hardest issue for uh, adjusting to life in America is social. Is the, the social the social cues are very very different, and in China you're not you're not pressured to always like have to speak, you know, like you can be in a group and be quiet and it's okay, but here like everybody's kind of jockeying for, for position and, and wanting their identities and, you know, opinions to be known to everybody. And, and that there's a lot of pressure. So that's what I've learned from, from a lot of uh, the Chinese students I know is that 
maybe in the past there was financial pressure that seems to be much less the case today. And then there might be some academic pressure. Again, Chinese students are soaring, but it's the social pressure that I think creates a separate subculture and just the interests and, and whatnot. And even with students that come over very early, they call them parachute kids, you know, who have come over early because their parents may think they wouldn't get into Beida, to the University or Tsinghua, whatever. So then they come to America and with the ideas that they have a better opportunity to get into American universities. But even in those cases in middle school, there tends to be, you know, a clustering. Why do you think that is, Jenny? Yeah, I think there's, you know, definitely, I mean, at least from my own experience, um, being a international student, Chinese students in the U.S., I do feel there's, you know, a certain gap between uh, American students and uh, international students um, or like Chinese students. I think there are different reasons. One is definitely the cultural and the education we receive in China. Um, so for example, when I was still in high school or in even in college, we didn't really take, you know, small classes and had, had a lot of like group discussions. But in the US, when I went to Northwestern, like I was the only, I think I was the only Chinese or maybe like there are another one a person in our class and there was maybe 12, you know, students um, in total in a small class. And uh, we had to discuss, you know, all the time. And as a journalism student, uh, what we learned or what we practiced in school was basically, you know, uh, writing and uh, basically pretend you are already a professional, uh, you know, journalist and just do your work. And that was a totally different feeling from what I learned, from what I experienced in China. And that's definitely created some of the, you know, the gap, uh, just like I just mentioned. And on the other hand, I would say, um, you know, maybe, you know, for the students who came here uh, when they were still uh, in high school, you know, the situation would be better. But for those who came here for just for graduate school, just like Ying Ying, she came here for her PhD program. When she first arrived here, just like me, when I first arrived here, I put so much, um, I would say like energy and time to basically get to know this cultural. And sometimes it's just very difficult for us to think about you know, other aspects of the life, of our own life, you know, to, you know, social with American students. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of, you know, different like cultural nuance between uh, each other, even though we are, you know, around the same age. Um, and I'm hoping, uh, you know, like maybe universities or other organizations can really create some services or just programs mm -hmm. to support Chinese international students and to really bring together, you know, different groups. Uh, and I think that would really benefit not only, you know, international students, but also American students, because there are more like diversity um, in the, I mean, on campus. Um, and that's, you know, what I'm hoping for. Well, I think and I'm actually with this film, that's initially one of our goals had been to hopefully show the film on, on university campuses, not just with international students, but with, uh, American students too, to start a conversation. I think one of the things I'll never forget is when we started working on the film at Kirtan when we had interns work on the project with us and, and none of them were Chinese. And they said it really opened their eyes seeing how, how lonely it could be to be an international student and how often they would want to ask questions but just didn't know how or were afraid that their language wasn't good enough to and he said he really realized um, that he needs to take the first step, like that um, that not to assume they're fine and everything's great and they don't want to deal with him. It's more more that he may need to be the person to reach out. So really hopefully good. when it's public and when we're able to be out there in the public again, we can uh, show it tomorrow. Many universities, well, first of all, if you're in a very, if you're in a big town, often there are enough Chinese students so you can sort of stay, you know, cloistered in that. Right. If you're in a small university or in the Midwest or somewhere a little more remote, then you're more, you're forced to go out. But, but I do think schools are, obviously they have been catering to Chinese students in the sense that they want, they want them because they often pay full freight. And, but there's a, there's a, you know, a, perhaps just a lack of understanding of what it means to bring these Chinese students over and helping them adjust culturally and socially. And, 
in every way. And, and therefore, I think there's this feeling of, of we're just going to stick together, you know. Um, so, you know, kind of figured out. And, and I think a lot of it really is also, uh, and that's why this is so good that this film is going to be seen in China, because there tends to be this kind of dream, right? This American dream. And, and uh, I don't know, maybe lately that, that dream has been punctured a little bit. Um, Americans have a China dream too, and I have seen it both ways. It's, oh, if, you know, for, for Americans, a lot of that China dream is an economic dream. Oh, if I can only say, sell a widget to every, you know, to half the Chinese population, whatever. And, but there's so much lack of understanding about what it really means to live abroad, to, to interact with, with local citizens, you know, and um, hopefully this film will go a ways toward improving that understanding. There have been a couple of films recently, I think they try to get to the heart of it. Another one is uh, American Factory, right? Where they talk about the interaction between American and Chinese workers. And there's such a giant gap still, I feel. And, mm -hmm. and those of us who have experienced both countries really uh, particularly sense it, <laughs> you know. Um, Diane, when you got involved in the film, what, what steps did you take to try and support it then? Yeah, so, uh... They, Jenny and Brent, they were working on it in 2017, and I came in almost a, exactly a year later in 2018. And I think our goal uh, was to, to put a timeline together and figure out well, what do we need to do to, to move this forward, the film forward. And um, the film was still not finished, and we realized that a natural ending would be when the trial happens. And Unfortunately, the trial had been delayed. So then now we're into 2019 that we would have to wait for the trial. But what we decided to do was to start editing. And instead of just waiting till the trial's over and start editing, that we could at least start to edit um, ahead of time and start building the story. Because we also wanted the film out as quickly as possible after the trial was over. Um, so that meant to finding funding. And I think that was a big priority for us was uh, different ways of finding funding. And we um, just started re researching that. Sorry? Where did you find the funding in the end? So we, we first got a huge support from um, Sundance in, in just supporting our film in um, the creative uh, producing fellowship. So they, we had other people looking at it that, that introduced to a whole other world. Um, and then we did uh, get, we were able to find four investors and one led to the next, to the next, to the next, which we'll always be so grateful for. They all were so supportive and believed in the film and really became partners, not just because they helped us finance it, but because they really believed in the story. They believed in Jenny and wanted us to, to make it happen. And one of the investors, uh, actually their husband and wife team that we're so um, always be grateful for. Right away, he said, I want to help you with fundraisers. So we had two fundraisers in New York and Chicago and and it, and we had a huge audience of international students who all came what together. What drew him and her, the couple, to the project? I'm sorry? What, did the, what drew the couple to the project? because they were both international students as well, came to the United States. They went to uh, Peking University too. Mm -hmm. So they could relate in so many ways how it would feel. First of all, like you said, um, how, how much of an accomplishment it was to be in Peking University. You know, the top students go there and that was Ying Ying. So she was able to accomplish that when she came from a poor family. So I, I think they really believed in her as a person, like, wow, she accomplished all this. And then she comes to the United States. Her family hadn't even ever left their, um, their yeah. village before. And now they put all their hopes in me and, and allowed her to come to the United States. Mm -hmm. but I think they really related to that story mm -hmm. and wanted, uh, you know, just like Jenny is saying, you know, to try to help people understand who Yingying Ying was, that She's not just this victim in this crime story, but that she had hopes and dreams and uh, hopefully bring understanding to that. Yeah, they so, also, go ahead. I was gonna say, they also have a, a daughter. The, their daughter goes to school with my daughter. So um, huh. 
my wife's Chinese, and so we have a, ah, a young daughter that goes to school together. <laughs> yeah, so another another connection. But I think that, I think too they were thinking they were thinking about you know their their daughter and really putting her in that in that place of yin yang. I, mm -hmm. I I do that every time I watch the film. Just think you know think about if this was if this was my daughter. You know. Well, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. It, yeah, to have an emotional connection and to think about that. How did you meet your wife, Brent? So she's also from Shanghai, and I met her at, at graduate school at, at Berkeley. So we worked on a we worked on a project. Um, she's a filmmaker too. I'm a filmmaker too. Yeah. So this this project, she's a filmmaker too, uh, called um, the Women's Kingdom about uh, uh, the Moso people in Yunnan province. Oh. Yeah. So we. Married to someone who. <laughs> yeah, we 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 fell in love making a documentary about. A group of women that do not believe in marriage. <laughs> in <practice laughs> okay, for those who don't already know, most of culture is very, very female. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you call it? Female uh, matriarchy. Yeah, matriarchy. Yeah. 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 yeah, so women, women right? Are women in charge. Mm -hmm. They get to have multiple lovers. Right. Yes. And, uh, like, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 your your wife sounds pretty incredible too. Um, that's interesting. Well, Berkeley is, is a place where my son went there and, and that was where I noticed that when I went to his, his apartment, this giant apartment building, I would get in the elevator, it was always all Chinese talking, speaking Chinese. I felt like I was in China. I walked out, you know, just like everywhere I went, I heard Chinese. I was like, oh, okay, this is, uh, you know, so, so there's, and, you know, wonderful Chinese restaurants there too. Um, and that's that's what I'm saying. It's so evident. There's an, a documentary film that is also, I, I hope it's okay that I share, but I highly encourage people to see it. It's at Sundance. I happen to see it. it's the upcoming Sundance called um, Try Harder. And it's about the, the Lowell High School where it's overwhelmingly Chinese and these kids are killing themselves to try to get into a good college. You know, it's, it's a, just a huge moment. Of course, the case of Harvard was very, very interesting. And, you know, it's a very complex situation. Uh, the integration of Chinese students in America, it's, um, it's fraught with all sorts of things. And, and of course, the, the temperature keeps changing in terms of mm -hmm. public opinion so much that I, I do hope that we should you know, we can really, and that's why I, I love what we do, making films, documentaries, or narratives. I have incredible respect for documentarians because you're walking into the unknown, you know? It's hard enough to make a film when you, when you have a plan, but um, when you walk into the unknown, you don't know what's going to happen. It's a process of discovery. So hats off to all of you. But, um, but it, it's so important that we really, you know, we've been kind of under a big cloud the last several years where China was again painted with a very broad black stroke. And uh, hopefully that's going to change now. And we can have, because for those of us, and, and Jenny, you mentioned the same thing, for those of us who have a lot of people to people connections, we know there's a whole world that is not really well represented in media because the media likes to focus on what the governments are doing, right? And we know that there's so much more, it's such a, a rich, uh, culture that's very bi bicultural. And so I think we, I'm getting messages that we have to start wrapping up. This time went so, so, so fast. Is there anything in closing that you, Jenny or Diana Brent wants to say? Oh, I, I would like to just encourage people to watch Funny Yang if they get the chance. Uh, we are in festivals and um, and we, we were so lucky to be um, partner with MTV Docs and they um, helped support a, theat a virtual theatrical release. So people can check out our website, funnying.com and find out more about um, funnying and where, how you can see it. So tell people how they can see it now and in the future, please. Well, definitely on, uh, there is virtual, there is a virtual theatrical release. So there's links in our uh, website that will, if you go to our website and see how do I see the film, it will it will direct you to links so that you can stream the film. Everything is virtual right now, unfortunately, but hopefully one day we can do it in person. And then MTV Docs, uh, 
like I said, they are our partners and they will hopefully come out with plans once we get beyond this um, release, the festival release and, and how they will bring it out. And then our hope is also to bring it out in China. We did have a festival last year, um, premiere last December, and uh, we're now talking to partners in, in China. And I, th I think for me, I also just want would love for folks to see it as uh, the film is a way, hopefully, to 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 break stereotypes. Like you said, everyone kind of sees the international students in one light. And I know from this film, I got to know Jenny and I got to know Yanny and saw how even between the two, there's so much alike, but so many differences too. And um, the only way we can break stereotypes is, is to humanize um, these stories. I do want to ask real quick, Jenny, do you have any other upcoming projects that you want to discuss? So I'm, I mean, for me, my interest in documentary filmmaking is really about uh, Chinese experience in the US and also women's rights. So right now I'm developing a project, again, about Chinese American experience, but it's still in development. Uh, so I'm hoping to, you know, start production maybe later this year. I hope you stay in touch about that. I would very much be curious to see what you're working on because I've, I've explored many topics. There's a film uh, that I developed for a while that the, the writer got extremely busy. Um, but it's about parachute girls and it's based on the incident that occurred in Southern California where a, a Chinese student was tortured by others. And so it's really an exploration of how does this happen? And, you know, there's many, many incredible stories um, involving the Chinese community. Again, it's a whole subculture that many people in Los Angeles have never been to San Gabriel Valley, you know, and they don't know. And what, if I, I've often taken them to get like, you know, go to Dean Kefong or whatever. <laughs> And they, they're stunned. It's just 10 minutes away from downtown, you know? So anyway, Brent, anything else you wanna add? I, I, Diane did a great job. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, for me, this is a film that's not a true crime film, but a, a, a film that really celebrates just this incredible, brilliant young woman that, you know, Ying Ying was and her, her amazing family. I, I say, you know, all the time, I wish I had, you know, I wish I had her family, you know? Um, uh, and, I, and I hope when I watch the film, you know, it, it almost brings Ying Ying back to life. You know, it's almost a way to share her legacy and share a story in a, in, a, in a bigger way. So it's almost like you meet her and you get to know her. Um, um, and I hope other people have a chance to see the film and, and fall in love with her. And like Diane said, that the film breaks, breaks these stereotypes that have been really, really kind of terrible during the, the Trump era. And I hope I hope things, you know, I th hope things change and the film is a way to, to, to help with that. Yeah, I think, I think it, in some ways too, it is a reflection of the incredible pace of change that China's undergone and, and to some degree America, but, you know, to have parents who grew up in the countryside, she goes to Peking University and then to be at a top university here. It's just like the cultural and generational gaps but the love of the family still comes through so strong. Like it doesn't matter, you know, they, they can't speak English and they are completely, and you know, Ying Ying was just getting to know America and put to the, her parents who barely, as you say, went to a big city, even in China. That is just like, just a, it's such a, a, a giant leap. So it's like all these leaps that are being taken because of the pace of change and because of extraordinary individuals that can rise out of certain circumstances. So it is It is in that way, yes, a celebration. It's a, it's a tragedy, but a celebration as well. Thank you so much to the three of you for bringing this film to the world. And I do hope more and more people see it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janet. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you.